Yeah, what's up ladies and gentlemen and welcome to episode 60 of the Sailor Jerry podcast. My name is Matt Cothran. I am still your host and today is Thursday, April 20th, 2023 and Sailor Jerry Spice Drum is still made the old school way. 92 proof, bold, and smooth as hell. Happy 420 to all those who celebrate. I hope everybody is doing good out there. I hope everybody is feeling fine. Uh, Shout out to all of our listeners and watchers and supporters around the world. The first week of Coachella has wrapped what uh what an incredible festival first of all okay i'm not a coachella hater uh there's a ton of them out there and i get it you know i understand the hate but i love music more than i hate coachella and coachella is awesome when it comes to music that you might not know about the cool thing about the coachella stream uh, is a stream that i love you can just watch all the stages Uh, on YouTube, and the audio is great. The cameras are amazing. Uh, It's a really cool experience. But that being said, okay, who stole the show? Bad Bunny, you know, Frank Ocean. Of course, everyone was so excited to see Blink-182. I saw Blink-182 a zillion times back in the day, of course, probably like most people listening to this. I didn't even know I was that excited to see the original lineup back together. The somewhat original lineup. The Travis Barker original lineup back together. Uh, and and I found myself glued to the fucking YouTube. Blink was so good. Maybe I should scale that back a little bit. They weren't... They were good. Okay? It was Blink. But it was awesome to see. It was a cool thing to see. Uh, and who else was good? Scowl ripped it. Of course, big shout out to Scal. A uh, big step up for them to play Coachella this year. Absolutely awesome. Um, you know, you got Wet Leg. Linda Linda's played. Bjork was absolutely incredible. Uh, Push a T, you know, started it off on Saturday. That was a big one for me. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio spotted in the crowd by TMZ. Making moves. No Paris Hilton this year. Okay. Paris has stepped away from Coachella. Her Coachella era is done. She's a mom now. Give her her space, okay? But the show must go on. Uh, Coachella weekend two. You know, I go back and forth. What's the better weekend, you know? I mean, obviously the bands are the same, but I feel like you get more special guests. You get that nervous energy on week one. But, you know, like, for example, Bad Bunny and Post Malone had some audio technical difficulties during their performances. That's probably not going to happen on weekend two. They work out all the kinks, you know. So it's a little bit of a toss up, but I always would ride with week one if I had to choose. Um, But anyways, Coachella, incredible festival. If you can't be there in person, watch on YouTube. I swear to God. You'll enjoy it, and you will definitely come across a band that you've never heard of that you probably like. Our guest today is, uh, you know, someone very special to me. I think he's an absolute legend uh, in the punk rock world, uh, you know, and that's not just to me. That's to anybody, really, who knows of, of, of Colin and of GBH. But, uh, you know, the first Bronx tour that we ever did, 2003, was with uh, Circle Jerks, GBH, and a band called Missing 23rd out of Ventura. And it's funny, I, you know, I've been looking back on so much stuff this year because it's 20 years of our first record, and these times, they, you know, they come around once. So it's important to, uh, to feel it, you know what I mean, and, and to appreciate it and to experience it. So that's what I've been doing. Um, but anyways, the first Bronx tour, 2003, Circle Jerks, GBH, Missing 23rd. Uh, you know, you have moments in your life where you can say you look back and, and it's like a blur. You know, you know it was fun, but it was a, truly a blur. And that's an expression that a lot of people use. Um, and sometimes it fits and sometimes it's a little bit of uh, an exaggeration, you know. But this specific tour 
for me is legitimately a blur and it's the best like blur ever. Uh, you know, I just have random memory moments of like a, a pool party, uh, breaking into a, like a hotel pool in Florida, uh, that had like a lazy river and everyone was on inner tubes and, and, you know, drinking beers and hanging out after the show. Um, you know, I have a memory in Minneapolis going to see body count, uh, on the last night of tour after our show was over body count was playing in Minneapolis. Uh, and it was totally insane, but the GBH guys, you know, and, and I, I get into a little bit of this with Colin in, in the interview itself, but the GBH guys to me, you know, a, a lot of that second wave UK punk stuff, I didn't really know that much about, you know, like I, I knew like, give me fire. And I knew a couple of GBH tunes, city baby and, and all that stuff. Like the, you know, what a guy like me would know, you know what I mean? But watching them play. Uh, every night back in 2003, when I was still kind of figuring out what I was doing, uh, you know, on stage and, and, and in the Bronx, you know, it was awesome. And Colin is one of the greatest front men. He's got style. Uh, he's got attitude. He's got humor and he's got a voice, you know, he's kind of underappreciated, I think, um, in that way. Uh, he's a great, great front man, an awesome dude. And watching that band play every night was so incredible. Shout out to, you know, Ross, Jacques, Scotty, the rest of the gang. You know, we became friends after that. Every time we would go to England, we'd hang with GBH. And, you know, music is just an incredible thing like that. Like never in a million years would I have thought that I would, you know, just have like a career path that coincided with GBH. I mean, that's so insane. You know, um, so nothing but love for those guys and nothing but love for punk rock, for rock and roll, for music of all kinds. Uh, it's the best. OK, it's time for episode 60. Colin Abrahal is the lead singer of legendary Birmingham street punk pioneers GBH. In this episode, we catch up with Colin as he and his bandmates are set to embark on a massive U.S. tour celebrating 40 years of their landmark album, City Baby's Revenge. Of course, we also talk about the history of punk with Colin. We dive into his lyric writing process, staying dangerous, and why sometimes it's not the best to think about the legacy while you're leaving it. And why the Rolling Stones are always going to be better than the Beatles. So sit back, relax, pour yourself some Sailor Jerry, and let's go! Abrahal, thank you so much for being here on the Say the Jerry podcast. Uh, you know, how, how are you doing today? Okay, recovering from the weekend. We we're in um, Ireland and Northern Ireland. And we had a few flight issues, as uh, you always do, but we made it. Nice. And made, nice. made it home, which is <laughs> probably more important. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, well, you know, thank you for taking the time to be here today. Uh, Pleasure. you know, honestly, my man, you're an absolute legend. Uh, oh. in incredible, incredible front man. You know, GBH, uh, you know, coming to the states here shortly to celebrate 40 years yeah. of City Baby's Revenge, which is absolutely insane. Yeah, before I was speaking to you, I was doing bits of the visas that we've got to get. So that's, a, that's another headache to... Uh... I'm glad that I'm not the only front man who has to do paperwork. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Pain in the uh, backside. Let's do a little bit of background on the band for our listeners who, who might not okay. be familiar with you, okay? 
the band started uh what was it, it was 70 79 79 which we, is the year formed... i was born which is crazy <laughs> <laughs> we we formed in 79 but we didn't play our first show till 1980 how did you become the singer in gbh how did it all happen for i you? don't know I, I i thought i was going to be the bass player because uh I bought a bass guitar off a friend at school for eighteen pound. I don't know why eighteen pound. It's a you know strange figure, and he was a, a big status quo fan. So yeah, I, I went I went round to his house and he showed me how to play in my chair. You know, a status quo song, which is just a bump. But dump. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, and that was it. And uh, and then I got home and thought. I can't hear it. And then someone said, oh, you need an amp and a speaker. <laughs> so, so I thought, oh, so I managed to get an amp and a speaker. And and then when, when the band formed, I was kind of organised it all. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do then? And so I, I became the singer by uh, by virtue of having nothing else to do. It's crazy how often yeah. it happens that way. It, it's, it happens that way yeah. so many times where it's just like, you know, you become singer by default or because you're the guy who's like hanging around when the band's writing songs or or whatever. Uh, but that's that's destiny, my man. That's destiny. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. You know, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. So how, you know, before we get into, you know, the, the first wave of, of punk in England, how did how did kind of music first come into your life? Just but, but the radio was on. 24 hours a day in our house. So I was, you know, grew up listening to like, you know, the, but I was, I was listening this morning and the, they played a Beatles song and somehow I knew all the lyrics to it and I've never <laughs> sat down and listened, you know, and read all the lyrics, but it, I guess it was just growing up with the Beatles, the Stones, you know, it, the radio was always on. We had a few um, show LPs, you know, like South yeah. Pacific and, uh, stuff like that and music was just always there so uh what what do you do for beatles versus stones where do you sit oh stones yeah yeah Yeah. always always they were the bad boys weren't they so uh, (laughs) you gotta go with that nice and then how did uh you know the the famous first wave of, of punk in england how did that hit you you know how did punk first come across your radar just Talking, like I say, I was at school and people we used to talk in the playground and people used to go, have you heard of that thing called punk? And they <laughs> spit at each other and stuff like that. And uh, then, I, you know, you'd read stuff in the papers or hear stuff. And uh, and then I went to see the Ramones and uh, I heard Sheena is a punk rocker on the radio. And I thought, yeah, that's good. And then went to, in 77, I was still at school and went to see the Ramones in Birmingham. Oh and man, that that was it. Changed my life. Yeah, was that their first tour? It's the one when they recorded "It's Alive." Oh, it, it was that tour, I think. Oh man, that how 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 good were they? Like, oh, in- they were just indescribable. You know, cause I, I I went there with three or four people from school, and somehow got lost, and I was trying to get the bus home on my own, and then got a. Uh, I was walking to the bus stop and all these football hooligans were walking <laughs> towards me and they went, look, there's a, there's a punk, let's get him and chase me. And I just got on the bus into, and they were Aston Villa fans and I'm an Aston Villa fan, but I wasn't going to hang around and explain to them. you know. <laughs> so luckily I made it onto the bus. The bus driver shut the doors and they were like banging on, you know, like in a movie and he wouldn't open the doors to let him in. So I was so I, I owe him my life and uh, my career, I suppose. We had a situation like that one time on tour in Italy. We were we were in a town outside of Milan, and uh, we were waiting for a bus to go into Milan and have dinner. And a group of uh, hooligans just came running from around the corner, <laughs> and it was like nowhere. We were like, it was like yeah. the streets were closed. It was nowhere. They came running straight at us, and they had pipes and a hammer Jeez. and all this. And yeah, and they thought, I guess you know, they came screaming at us in Italian, and we thought we were going <laughs> to have to fight these guys. And uh, you know, we just said, you know, uh, American, United States, that type of shit. You know, oh, that's and even they, worse. I guess there was a big clash between uh, Zenith and and AC Milan at that point. 
and a yeah. bunch of AC Milan fans had gotten beat up in 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 Zenith, and uh, they thought we were they were in town playing them, so they thought we were like Russian hooligans or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what the deal was, but we thank God. But the bus, same thing, the bus pulled up right as those guys were standing there yeah. with pipes and hammers and we got on the bus and he shut the door we were like drive 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 <laughs> <laughs> gbh is part of the quote unquote you know second wave which is you know yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I i think the second wave is responsible for you know kind of cementing the sound of punk you know i think after the first wave it might have gone you know maybe a couple different directions but it was the second wave that said no this is going to be hard. This is going to be yeah, fast. Yeah. This is going to be dangerous. Yeah. This is going to be crazy. You yeah. know, well, so a lot, a lot of the first wave were, were were bands already, and then they sort of jumped on the punk bandwagon, did a couple of albums, and then jumped off. But uh, it, it kind of spread all over England. So it, you know, in like Manchester, Newcastle, it, you know, up in, even in Scotland, uh, you know, it, we arrived sort of a little bit late to the scene, I suppose, but that was only, you know, because of geography and uh, and stuff. And uh, when we heard it, we thought, yeah, this is for life. This is what we're going to do. And uh, we're still doing it. Yeah, man, it's incredible. And for you as, as a front man, uh, as, as the guy on stage kind of leading the charge, was that, you know, I, I know you, you, you kind of, you know, defaulted your way into it. But once you were in that role, did did something kind of click over? Like, did it feel did it feel kind of natural, or how long did it take you to kind of feel comfortable with being, you know? Well, I'm still the man. not comfortable. So I've got <laughs> no, I've got nothing to hide behind except a microphone stand, which is only that thin, and the others can hide behind guitars and uh, and stuff. But it, it, you get used to it. You, you have to prepare yourself, I think, mentally for it. And, uh, and then just do it. What uh, what makes a good front man or front woman to you? What do you think the characteristics are? Know. Communication, maybe. Um, not not standing there looking at your shoes singing. <laughs> you, you've got to you've got to put it. You know, if people are paying to see you, you've got to put on a bit of a show, no matter how kind of corny that sounds. And do the best you can, I suppose. Yeah. What about uh, what about lyrics? Who who writes the lyrics in GBH? Who's taking responsibility for that? Is that Me, you? I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've ta I've taken to the last three or four albums. Um, I walk my dog in the morning in in the park, and when you when you walk and you're not thinking about anything else, so that's when I formulate the lyrics, and and when I go to bed at night, I'll I'll go through them line, you know, in my head, really? line by line. And if I if I get mixed up, I have to start from the beginning again. So, uh, and you just like refine them, and um, we well, even you know, you know, they have, they, they have to make sense. Yeah, I mean, every, it's it's interesting because everyone's kind of process is is a little bit different. But but that's that's funny you say about like at night because I I that, like for me. Like even last night, like I was just in bed, just like I just could not sleep. I was just thinking about and if you don't write it down, you'll you're destined mm. to forget it. Yeah. But, yeah, true. you know, do you are you someone who, you know, writes basically only when you know you have a record coming out or do you write kind of all the I time? I kind of write lyrics all the time. I, I think people will say something or you'll hear something on the TV or the radio or something like that. And you think, oh, that's great. Or if I twisted it around that way it might you know and and i'll just write it down so i've got a book of sometimes it's just a couple of words sometimes it's a sentence sometimes a paragraph and then i can uh, when I've, i know i've got to do it i can not i'll get a separate piece of paper and uh, write the title at the top if if i know the title and uh, you know work through it that way nice nice and you know like we previously stated here you know 40 years of city baby's revenge looking back on the album a little bit okay yeah what can what can you tell us about the writing and recording process of that record specifically and what what was gbh like in the studio in 1983 <laughs> oh we were, we were quite professional yeah even then yeah yeah because we wrote some well some of the um, influence for the lyrics and stuff. We, we did our first tour of America in '83, yeah. And we'd, I think, we'd written probably half of City Baby's Revenge. So when we got back, we 
we finish writing it and you know jamming the tunes out and all that and there, there is quite a lot i listened to it on vinyl actually um the other day and it i thought it sounded really naive but you know by today's standards uh, but there's lots of american references that we wouldn't have had had we not been to america you know earlier in that year so uh it, it's it was quite a, quite eye opening in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, speaking of your first tour in, in 1983, when we toured together, which was crazy, the first yeah, Bronx that's 20 tour, years ago, wasn't yes, it? Yes, insane. So the first yeah. Bronx tour ever uh, was with Circle Jerks, GBH, us, and this band called Missing Twenty Third. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that was in 2003. And I, it was, I mean, it was, I was a mess of a human being by then but yeah and, <laughs> and but you know your first tour is just like it's i it's one of the greatest memories of my life and it was it was so fun being able to to watch you guys every night and we kind of became fast friends on that tour because yeah, yeah. you know I, I i'd grown up obviously southern california kid i knew the circle jerks and i knew gbh i i, I knew the hits you know but i didn't know the i didn't know the the band you know so mm -hmm being able to watch you guys every single night and get to know you guys. It was just, it had a, a huge impact on me. You know, it was, it was such a cool experience. And uh, one thing you said that was so funny one night, you, you said, you used to say this thing where you'd go, you know, we first came to the United States in 1983. Now it's 2003. That's exactly 17 years later. <laughs> <laughs> And all the mathematicians go, no, no, no. no it's good, to, it's good <laughs> to say something where uh, people, um, at, at the moment, I've got this, we've, we've got a song called, after the last album, called 50 Watt. And yeah. it was about us being 50 plus years old. <laughs> so and I always, int always introduce it by saying, um, believe it or not, there's people on this stage 60 years of age and, you know, you sometimes get a reaction from the crowd. And then uh, I say, but obviously not me. I'm only 27. <laughs> and and some people think you're being serious. And they go, no, you're not. And, and then I, I go into this little stick. I won't do it now because it will spoil the tour. So uh, Oh, God. Well, you've always had good humor, man. It's classic English. Yeah, yeah. It's like classic English dry humor. You always knock it out of the park. And it's one thing I love about you as a front man. Well, you've got to have humor. There's nothing else to uh, to fall back on. You can't be serious the whole time. No, no, absolutely not. Are you guys? Uh, you know, you guys got the chisel, and you got nice coming out with you for these shows. Yeah, uh, and chisel. MDC. No, nah, oh shit, nice. MDC are doing most of it, I think. Oh hell yeah, that's gonna be sick. And that you know that starts uh, on May sixth in Amityville, New York. Yeah, May yes, 6th, Amityville, New York, and that's all the way across the U.S., so everyone can make sure and go check out those shows. Are you going to be doing, uh, are you just playing, you know, the the bulk of the record? Are you doing the record front to back? Is there any anything special going on? We're doing just... a, we'll be doing a sort of combination of, because we didn't get a chance to do City Baby Attack by Rats 40th anniversary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be a cross between Attack by Rats and Revenge and all the hits as well oh man that's gonna be good that's gonna be good it, you know 40 years of a record uh, over 40 years as a band you know you guys have been active the whole time too i mean momentum came out in 2017 mm -hmm. what's what would you say is you know the the driving force or the secret to gbh just getting on with it and not sitting around and uh resting on your laurels i suppose just to, just to keep going that was our ambition as to be a band anyway so we, we're just continuing our ambition it's not easy obviously you know people if no. people think being in a band is just being in a band you know as as everyone progresses as as lives individual lives take shape it's it, it can be so hard to maintain obviously still a lot more gbh to come down the road but you know how proud of of the band and and everything you guys have accomplished you know are you at this point in your career yeah we are but we, we don't talk about it really we just yeah just keep just get on with it just i mean we're going to portugal on friday so that that's what we're thinking about at the moment 
It's so cool, man. It's so cool. It's, you know, it's like, I, I, I have so much respect for you and so much respect for the guys because of not only your incredible musicianship, uh, your, your dedication to the craft, but just, you know, the grind and the longevity and you mm. guys, you guys love making music. You love making music yeah, yeah, and, you, and you love, the, and you, that's the point of it. it yeah. The best hour of the day isn't it? when you're on tour. <laughs> the other 23 of problems and this, that, and the other, but, that's a, that hour on stage is it's like the easiest and most enjoyable bit of the day. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, you share the stage with some absolute legends, you know, and Jock Ross and Scotty, of course. What can you what can you say about the bond you guys have as a band? Well, we like I don't know, we just take the piss out of each other all the time. <laughs> well, we all take the piss out of Scott, basically. And uh, we ju we just laugh all the time, you know, and have fun. Which you know, there's no point doing it if it makes you miserable and unhappy. So so true. And those guys, you know, shout out to those guys. Amazing, amazing dudes. Um, you know, it, it's absolutely incredible what you guys have accomplished and what you continue to do. Any plans for new music in the in the future yeah, yeah, after we, this? We, we we're writing stuff sort of all the time. And we, we try and sneak it in, in um, when we've got a song to a certain point, we do it in sound checks. So, uh, yeah. you know, we you hone it that way, I suppose. Ideally, we'd need time off the road to go in the studio and like write it, you know, like methodically. But we haven't got that luxury, so we just have to do it whenever we can. Uh, what about life outside of the band, my man? What what kind of stuff are you doing when it, GBH is not happening? Well, during lockdown, um, I started. I was in my. I've got a cabin down the bottom of my garden, and I started making uh, little models of motorcycles. Really? You know, you know, they come in like a kit form. Yeah. And there's kind of G, one ninth scale, so that it's kind of like GI Joe you know uh, and uh, they you cut them out they made of plastic you cut them out glue them together paint them and uh, I love doing that just I've got music on yeah I'm happy I like that I like that that's really cool uh let's go through some bands here okay okay do a little battle of the bands mm -hmm. tell me who you got you got the Ramones versus the Stooges oh well, one wouldn't exist without the other, I don't think. So we'll have to go with the Stooges. Yeah. Ramones covered, you know, 1969 and stuff like that. Are you guys doing your Stooges cover on this tour? I think we will be, yeah. It was yeah. on the album, so yeah. it better be. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great cover. The classic English punk question here, Sex Pistols versus Clash, who you got? Oh, another one. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind the bollocks. This is the greatest album ever made, without a shadow of a doubt. But I think the Clash were a better band, if you know what I mean. Who was better they live? Were... Did you did you see them both? I never saw the. Oh, I saw we played with the Pistols, in, but that wasn't till '99. I saw the Clash in '79, and they were good. Well, you know, more than good. If I'd have seen them on the same day at the same time, if you know what I mean, I could have. I don't know. It, I can't it's, I can't choose. I'll say yeah. the clash. I'll say the clash. Wow. Okay. So you're gonna go with never mind the bullets but, as as the record, but the clash yeah. as the band. Yeah, yeah. Well the, the pistols that didn't last, they only did one album, didn't they? Basically. And the clash did more and t obviously toured more. And uh, yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a difficult question. Is the is the mystique of the pistols uh deserved, you know, were 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 they that big in that moment? You know, obviously I, I love the pistols. I, yeah, I, I yeah, loved yeah. I love Johnny Rotten. Were the pistols everything that we love them to be? There's probably more hype about them than there was about the clash. Because like I said, they, they weren't they weren't around that long, really. But Steve Jones is like a, an awesome guitarist. And the yeah. sound, he formed a band a few years later, well, maybe in the late 80s, 90s, called Fantasy Seven. And um, if you ever get to hear any of that stuff, it's fucking brilliant. Oh, can I swear? Yeah, yeah, you can swear. Oh, you can oh swear. It's, fucking, it's <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Fantasy Seven. 
I think they might have made one album, but I've got I've, I've got some old demo tape. What about Motorhead versus Sabbath? Oh, Motorhead. Oh, I'm from Birmingham, but I was never a big Black Sabbath fan for some reason. Did you see? Uh, have you seen Motorhead? Did you see them early on? Yeah, we saw them on the Bomber tour. So that would be eighty, was it seventy nine, eighty, something like that. Our roadie, uh, Boring John, who's no longer with us. That was his first tour. He got a job working for Motorhead. So he got us on the guest list. I think that was our first ever guest list, you know, <laughs> time. And that's when they, they used to have the, the plane, you know, above the stage. Oh, like, wow. Up with the lights on the propellers yeah. and all that. Yeah, but that was brilliant as well. But I wasn't, like I said, I was never a big Sabbath fan. I know it's sacrilege to some people. but Sometimes Sabbath can be just a little too... For lack of a better term, like it can just be too stony, you know what I mean? Stony rock, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other guys love them, but uh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm I could see why team. Jock lo- I could see why Jock loves them. <laughs> yeah, you, you used to think if they speed it up a little bit more, yeah, you know, if it's on the beat. Do you have a favorite band at all? Probably the Clash. Yeah, or a, a band called the Godfathers definitely would be my number two. Who, who are the they're, Godfathers? They're an English band. Um, they used to be the Sid Presley experience back in the early 80s. And then they became the Godfathers. And they're still going today. But uh, it's more like rock and roll with a punk attitude. Awesome. That sounds awesome. All right. Godfathers, Fantasy 7. I got some, got some new music to listen to here. Yep. <laughs> awesome uh you know colin i don't want to take too much more of your time man really really appreciate you being on the sailor jerry podcast here it's been a pleasure yeah great great to see you give give my love to the rest of the guys everyone please go out and support this tour when it comes stateside first show is may 6th in new york it's running all through the states incredible bands supporting opening up uh gbh is one of the greatest bands you will ever see uh you know so safe travels to you my friend um one one last question for you it's it's a little bit it's a little bit of a doozy here but you know you've you've seen a lot in your in your years on and off stage what to you uh is the meaning of life number 42 what's number 42 (laughs) it's a (laughs) it's a reference to the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy it's a, it was a book and a TV show, and they asked the same question, what, what is the meaning of life? And the answer is 42. Perfect, my man. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being a guest here on the Sailor Jerry podcast. Good luck on tour, my man. Kick some Thank ass. Thank you. Take care. All right, brother. All the best. Oh, yeah. That's a wrap on episode 60 of the Sailor Jerry podcast. As always, huge amounts of respect and gratitude to our guest, the one and only Colin Abrahal of GBH. Colin, appreciate your time, my man. Good luck on tour. If you guys want to go get tickets to see GBH and MDC and Chisel and Nice, what an awesome show. Just Google GBH, the band, and you'll be able to find everything you need. You can follow them on Instagram as well, at GBH. And, uh, you know, follow me, at 2 and 3 Matman. Okay, be sure and like and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, leave a review. Leave a thumbs up. Leave a comment. All that shit helps. Of course, follow Sailor Jerry. And do not forget... That Sailor Jerry Spice Drum is still made the old school way. 92 proof, bold and smooth as hell. I'll see you in two weeks. Peace. Peace.